from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Ansible Fest 2020, brought to you by Red Hat. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Ansible Fest 2020. I'm your host with theCUBE, John Furrier, and we've got two great guests, uh, CUBE alumni Robin Bergeron, senior manager at Ansible community team, uh, welcome back, she's with Ansible and Red Hat, good to see you, and Matt Jones, chief architect for the Ansible automation platform. Again, both with Red Hat, Ansible was acquired by Red Hat. Robin used to work for Red Hat, then went to Ansible. Ansible got bought by Red Hat. Robin, great to see you. Matt, great to yep, see you. Yep, thanks for having me back again. It's good to see you. We're not in person, it's the virtual event. Thanks for coming on remotely to our CUBE virtual. Really appreciate it. I want to talk about the, um, and I brought that Red Hat kind of journey, Robin, we talked about it last year, but it really is an important point. The roots of Ansible and kind of where it's come from and what it's turned into and where it is today is an interesting journey because the mission is still the same. I want to like to get your perspectives because um, you know, Red Hat was acquired by IBM, Ansible's under Red Hat, all part of one big happy family. A lot's going on around the platform. Matt, you're the chief architect. Robin, you're on the community team. Collections, collections, collections is the message. Content, 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 community, a lot going on. So take a minute, both of you explain the Ansible Roots, where it is today, and the mission. Right, so the beginning of Ansible was really, um, there was a, a small team of folks, uh, and they'd actually been through an iteration before uh, that didn't use SSH called Funk. But you know, was, you know, let's make a piece of software that is open source that allows people to automate other things. Um, and we knew at the time that, you know, based on a piece of research that we had seen out of Harvard, that uh, having a piece of software be architected in a modular fashion wasn't just great for the software, but it was also great for developing uh, pathways and connections for the community to actually contribute stuff, right? Uh, if you have a car, this is always my analogy, if you have a car, you don't have to know how the engine works in order to, you know, swap out the windshield wipers or invent new windshield wipers, things like that. Um, the nice thing about modular architectures is that uh, it doesn't just mean that things can plug in, it means you can actually separate them into different spots to enable them to be plugged in. And that's sort of where we are today with collections, right? Uh, we've always had this uh, sense of modules, but everything, except for a couple of points in time, uh, all of the modules, the ways that you connect Ansible to the vast array of technologies that you can use it with, uh, all of those have always been in the full Ansible repository. Now we've separated out most of, you know, nearly everything that is not uh, absolutely essential to having in a, you know, a, a very minimal Ansible installation, broken them out into separate repositories um, that are usually grouped by function, right? So there, there's probably like a, a VMware something and a cloud something and a IBM ZOS something, things like that, right? Each in their own individual groups. So now not only can contributors find what they want to contribute to in much smaller spots that are not a sea of, you know, 5,000 plus folks doing work, uh, but now you can also choose to use your Ansible collections, uh, update them, run them, you know, independently of just the singular release of Ansible where you got everything, all the batteries included in one spot. Matt, this brings up the point about she's bringing in more advanced functionality. She's talking about collections. This has been kind of the Ansible formula from the beginning in its startup days, ease of use, easy, fast automation. Talk about the, uh, you know, you back in 2013 was a startup, now it's part of Red Hat. The game is still the same. Can you just share kind of what's the current um, guiding principles around Ansible this year? Because lots going on, like I said, faster, bigger, uh, a lot going on. Share your perspective, you've been there. Yeah, you know, what we're working on now is we're, we're taking this, this great tool that that has changed the way that automation works for a lot of people and we want to make it we want to make it faster and bigger and better we want it to scale better we want it to automate more and be easier to automate automate all the things that people want it to do and so we're really focusing on that scalability and flexibility flexibility robin talked about um content and collections right and and what we want to enable is 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 people to bring the 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 content collections the the collections the roles the models uh and use them in the way that they that they feel works best for them uh leaving aside some of the things that they maybe um maybe aren't quite as interested in and put it together in a way that that scales for them and and scales for uh global automation uh automation everywhere 
Yeah, I want to dig into the collections later, Robin, for sure, uh, and Matt. So let, let's, we'll, we'll put that on, on pause for a minute. I want to get into the event, the virtual event, obviously we're not face-to-face, -face. this is virtual. You guys are both keynoting. Matt, we'll start with you. If you can each give 60 seconds, kind of a rundown of your keynote talk, give us the quick summary this year on the keynotes. Matt, we'll start with you. Yeah, that's 60 seconds is tough. Okay, I'll give you a 60, if you need a minute and a half, we'll give you <laughs> more. For me. We'll give you 90 <laughs> seconds. Robin, that's going to be tough. Uh, Matt, we'll go we'll start I'll, with uh, you. I'll, I'll try. So this year, um, and I mentioned the focus on scalability and flexibility. You know, we, uh, on the product and on the platform, on the Ansible automation platform, the goal here is to bring content and, and flexibility of that content into the platform for you. We focused a lot on how you execute, how you run automation, how you manage your automation. And so bringing that content management automation into the system for you, it's really important to us. But what we're also noticing is that we people are, people are managing automation at a much larger scale. So we are updating uh, the Ansible Tower, Ansible AWX, the automation platform. We're, we're updating it to be more flexible in how it runs content and where it can run content. We're, we're, we're making it so that uh, execution of automation doesn't just have to happen in your data center, in one data center. We recognize that automation occurs globally and we want to expand that automation execution capability to be able to run globally and all report back into your central business. Uh, we're also expanding over the next six months, a year, uh, how well Ansible integrates with OpenShift and Kubernetes. This is a huge focus for us. We want, we want that experience for automation to feel the same whether you're automating at the edge in devices and virtual machines and data centers, as well as you know clusters and Kubernetes clusters anywhere in the world. That's awesome. That's why I brought that up earlier. I wanted to get that out there because it's worth calling out that the Ansible mission from the beginning was similar scope, easy <laughs> to do and simplify again, but now it's larger scale. Again, it's everywhere uh, harder <laughs> to do so and hence complexity being abstracted away. So thank you for sharing. We'll dig into that in a second. Okay, Robin, 60 seconds or more if you need it. Uh, your keynote uh, this year at Ansible Fest, give us the quick rundown. All right, um, well, I think uh, we probably know at this point, you know, the one of the main themes this year is called uh, Automate to Connect. Um, and, you know, the purpose of the community keynote is really to highlight the achievements of the community. So, you know, we are talking about, uh, well, we are talking about collections, you know, going through some of, you know, the very broad highlights of that uh, and also how that has contributed or not contributed, uh, how that is included as part of uh, the recent release of Ansible 2.10 which is really the first release where we've got, uh, got it very easy for people to actually start, you know, using collections and getting familiar with, you know, what that brings to them. Um, a good portion of the keynote is also just about, you know, innovation, right? Like how we do things in open source and why we do things in certain ways in open source uh, to, you know, accelerate us and, you know, how that compares, you know, with the Red Hat, you know, traditional product model, which is, you know, uh, we, kind of, uh, we do a lot of innovation upstream. We move quickly so that if something is maybe not the right idea, uh, we can move on. Um, and then in our products, you know, that's that's sort of the thing that we give to our customers that, you know, is tried, tested and true, all of that kind of jazz. Um, we also talk about, or I, I guess I also talk about, um, the uh, all of our initiatives that we're doing around diversity and inclusiveness, including some of the, uh, the code changes that we've made for, better, more inclusive language uh, in our projects and our downstream products, uh, our diversity and inclusion working group that we have in community land, which is, you know, just looking to embrace more and more people. Um, you know, it's a lot about connect connectivity, right? Uh, you know, to one of Matt's points about, you know, all the things that we're trying to achieve and, and how it's similar to, you know, the original principles, you know, the, the third one was, you know, it's always, we need to have it to be easy to contribute to. Um, that doesn't necessarily just mean in our community, right? Like we see in all of these workplaces, which is one of the reasons why we brought in Automation Hub that, that you know, folks inside like large organizations, you know, companies, government, whatever it is, are using Ansible and there's more and more and more, you know, there's one person, they tell their friend, they tell another friend and next thing you know, it's the whole department. And then you find people in other departments and then you've got 
a ton of people doing stuff. And we all know that, you know, you can do a bunch of stuff by yourself, but you can accomplish a lot more together. Um, and so, you know, making it easy to contribute inside your organization is not much different than being able to contribute inside the community. So this is just, you know, a further uh, recognition, I think, of what we see as just a natural extension of open source. I think the community angle is super important because you have the community as in terms of people contributing, but you also have multiple vendors now, multiple clouds, multiple integrations. The stakeholders yep. of collaboration have increased. It was just like, oh, like here's the upstream and et cetera, we're done and have meetings, do all that stuff. Um, and Matt, that brings me to my next question. Can you talk about some of the recent releases that have changed the content experience for the Ansible users in the upstream and within the automation platform? Well, so last year, you know, we released collections. Um, and we've really been moving towards that over the 2.9, 2.10 uh, timeframe. Um, and now I think you're starting to see sort of the realization of that, right? This year we've released uh, automation hub on cloud.redhat.com so that we can concentrate that vendor and partner content um, that Red Hat supports and certifies. Uh, in Ansible Fest, you'll hear us talk about private automation hub. This is bringing um, that content experience to the customer, to, to the user of this, this content, sort of helping you curate and manage that content yourself. Like, like Robin said, like we want to build communities around the content that you've developed. That's the whole reason that we've done this with collections is we don't want to bind it to Ansible core releases. We don't want to block content releases, all of this great functionality that the community is building. This is, this is what collections mean. It, it's, you should be able to, you should be free to use the collections that you want when you want it, regardless of when Ansible core itself is releasing. Can you just take a minute real quick and just explain what is collections uh, for folks out there who are rich? Cause that's the big theme here, collections. Uh, collections, collections, that's what I'm hearing resonate throughout the virtual hallways, if you will, <laughs> Twitter and beyond. <laughs> that's, um, that, that's, that's a good question. Like, what is a, what is a collection itself? Like, so we've talked a lot in the past about um, reusable content for Ansible. We, we talk a lot about roles and modules um, and we sort of put those off to the side a little bit and say, these are your reusable components. You can put them anywhere you want. You can put them in source control, distribute them through email. It doesn't matter. And then your playbooks, that's what you write. And, and that's your sort of blessed content. Collections are really about taking the modules and roles and plugins, the, the things that make automation possible and bundling, bundling those up together um, in groups of content, groups of modules and roles, or standing by themselves so that you can decide how that's distributed and how you consume that, right? Like you might you might have the, the Azure VMware or Red Hat satellite collection that you're using and you're happy with that, but you want uh, a new version of Ansible. You're not you're not bound to using one and the same. You can you can stick with the content that matters to you, uh, the roles, the modules, the plugins that work for you, and you decide when to update those and you know what the actual modules and plugins you're using are. So uh, I got to ask uh, the content question. Um, you know, I'm a content producer. We do videos as content, blog posts as content. Um, when you talk about content, it's code. Um, clarify that role for us because you got, you're enabling developers with content uh, and helping them find experts. This is a concept. Um, Robin, talk about this and Matt, you can weigh in too. Um, define what does content mean? It means different things. There's a word out there, man. Again, content could be. It, it is one of those words. It's right up there with developers. Yeah. You know, so, so many different things that that can mean, especially when content you have and a, the importance a, of the, a, of the a semantic comedian. of that. Explain it. It's, it's, it's important that people understand the semantics of the word content with respect to what's going on with Ansible. Yeah, and and Matt and I actually had a conversation about uh, the murkiness of this <laughs> word. I believe that was yesterday. Um, so <laughs> when I think about content, you know, and I try to put myself in the mind, you know, I my first job was a sysadmin, so I try to put myself in the mind of you know someone who might be using this content that I'm about to attempt to explain. Um, like Matt just explained, you know, we, we've always had these modules which were included in Ansible. Um, people have, you know, pieces of code that show, you know, very basic things, right? If I get the, one of the AWS modules, it would 
you know, I am able to do things like, I would like to create a new user. So you might make a role that actually describes the steps in Ansible that you would have to create a new user uh, that is able to access uh, AWS services at your company. Uh, there may be a number of administrators who want to use that piece of stuff, that piece of code over and over and over again, because hopefully most companies are getting bigger and not smaller, right? Uh, they want to have more people accessing all sorts of pieces of technology. So making some of these chunks accessible to lots of folks is really important, right? Because what, what good is automation if, you know, sure, we've taken care of half of it, but if you still have to come up with your own bits of code from scratch every time you want to invoke it, you're still not really leveraging the full power of collaboration. Um, so when we talk about content, it's to me, it really is things that are constantly reusable, that are accessible, uh, that you tie together with modules that you're getting from collections. Um, and I think it's that, that bundle, and you can keep those bits of reusable content in the collections or keep them separate, but you know, it's, it's stuff that is baked for you or that maybe somebody inside your organization bakes, but they only have to bake it once. They don't have to bake it in 25 silos over and over and over again. Matt, the reason why we're talking about this is interesting because you know, but, but this points out in my opinion, it's my opinion. This points out that we're talking about content as a word means that you guys are on the cutting edge of new paradigms, which is content is essentially code, but it's addressable, it's community, it's being shared. Someone wrote the code. It's a whole nother level of thinking. This is kind of a platform automation. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Um, so give us your thoughts because this is a critical component because the origination of the co content, <laughs> the code, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I love it. Content is, I've always said content, our content is, should be code, it's all data, but this is interesting. This is the cutting edge concept. Could you explain what it means from your perspective? Yeah, this is this is about building communities around that content, right? Like it's 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 that sharing that uh, didn't exist before. Like Robin mentioned, like you know, you shouldn't have to build the same thing a dozen times or a hundred times. You should be able to leverage the capabilities of experts and um, you know people who understand that section of automation the best. Like you know, I might be an expert in one field, or Robin's an expert in another field. We're automating in the same space we should be able to bring our own our own expertise and resources together and so this is what that content is like i'm an expert in one you're an expert in another let's bring them together as part of our automation community and share them so that we can use them and iterate on them and build on them and just constantly make them better and the, and the concepts are yeah. consumption there's consumption of the content there's the collaboration of the content there's the sharing uh, all this and his reputation, <laughs> his expertise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a multi-sided marketplace here, isn't it? Yeah, I read an article, I don't know, a year or two ago that said, you know, we've always evolved, you know, in the technology industry around, you know, if you have access to this, you know, first it was the mainframes, then it was, you know, whatever, uh, personal computers, uh, the cloud, you know, now it's, you know, containers, all this, but, you know, once everybody buys that mainframe or once everybody levels up their skills to whatever the next thing is that you can just buy, you know, there's not much left that actually can help you to differentiate from, you know, your competitors other than your ability to actually leverage all of those tools. Um, and if you can actually have better collaboration, I think, than, than other folks, then that is one of those points that actually will get you ahead in your digital transformation curve. So to you know, speak. I've been harping on this for a while. I think that cloud native finally has gone, when I say mainstream, I mean like on everyone's mind. Um, you look at the container uptake, you're looking at containers. We had IDC on, five to 10% of the enterprises are containerizing. That's huge growth opportunity. The IPO of say Snowflake on Amazon. I mean, how does this happen? That's a company that's went public as the most valuable IPO in the history of, of IPOs on, on Wall Street and it's built on Amazon, <laughs> doesn't have its own cloud. So it's like, I mean, this is this points to the new value that's being created on top of these new cloud native architectures. So I really think you guys are onto something big here and I think you're starting to see this no, new notions of how things are being rethought and reimagined. So uh, let's keep it up. Well, well, I got you guys here real quick. Uh, Ansible 2.1 community release. Tell us more about the updates there. Uh, 2.10. Uh, because, yeah. Oh, it's fine. I know some, I, I, I too have had, I'm like, why do we do that? But it's uh, semantic versioning. So I am 
more accustomed to this now. It's a slightly different world from when I worked on Fedora. Um, you know, I think the big highlight there is really collections. I mean, it's collections, collections, collections. That is all the work that we did, you know, it's under the hood, uh, over the hood, um, and really, you know, how we went from being all in one repo to breaking things out. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big line for, you know, where we're advancing uh, both the tool and also advancing the community's ability to actually collaborate together and, and in the, you know, as uh, folks start to actually use it, it's a big change for them potentially in how they can actually work together uh, in their organizations using apps. Well, a uh, one of the any things release we did focus on was ensuring that their ease of use, you know, that their experience had not changed. So if they have existing Ansible stuff that they're running, playbooks, mod, you know, roles, et cetera, um, they should be able to use 210 and not see any discernible change, right? That's all of the under the hood. Like that was a lot of, that was a lot of surgery, wasn't it, Matt? Like serious <laughs> amounts of work, so. So Matt, 2.10, does that means... impact the release piece of it for the developers and the customers out there? What does it change? It, you... It's a good. It's a good point. Like at least for the the longer term, this means that we can focus on the Ansible core experience, and and this is this is the part that you know we didn't touch on much uh, before now with the collections piece is that uh, now when we're fixing bugs, when we're iterating and making Ansible as an engine of automation better, we can do that without negatively impacting the 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 automation that, that people actually use. We can focus on sort of the core. Yeah, yeah, we can focus on the core experience of actually automating itself. Execution environments, Take, let's talk about that. What are they? Are they being used in the community today? What, what do you guys react to that? We're actually, we're, we're sort of in the, the middle of building this right now. Like uh, one of the things that we've struggled with is uh, when you, you need to automate, you need you need this content that we've talked about before, but beyond that, you know, you have the system that that sits underneath uh, the, the the version of Linux, the kernel that you're using. It, going even further, you need Python dependencies, you need library dependencies. These are hard and complicated things. Like in the Ansible Tower space, we have virtual environments which lets you install those things right alongside the Ansible Tower control plane. Oh, this this can cause a lot of problems. So execution environments, they, they take those dependencies, the the unit that is the environment that you need to run your automation in, and we're going to containerize it. You were you're just talking about this from the containerization perspective, right? We're going to build um, we're going to build more easily isolated, easy to use, distinct units of environments that will let you run your automation. This is great. This lets you, the person who's building the content for your organization, he can develop it and test it and send it through the CI process all the way up through production. It's the exact same environment. You can feel confident that the automation that you're running against the libraries and the models, the version of Ansible that you're using is the same when you're developing the content as when you're running it in production for your business, for your users, for your customers. And that's the nirvana. And this is really where you talk about pushing it to new limits. Um, real quick, just to kind of end it out here for Ansible 2020, Ansible Fest 2020. Um, obviously we're not virtual. Um, people aren't there in person, which is really an intimate event. Last year was awesome. Had the cube set right there, great event. People were intimate. What's going on for you, what you guys have for people? Uh, obviously we got the videos and we got the content, um, uh, media content. Um, what's the main theme? Robin and Matt, and what's going on for resources that might be available for folks who want to learn more? What's going on in the community? Can you just take a minute each to talk about some of the exciting things that are going on at the event that they should pay attention to? And obviously it's asynchronous so they can, can go anywhere anytime they want. It's the internet. Where can they go to hang out? Is there a hang space? Just give the quick uh, two second commercial. Robin, we'll start with you. All right. Uh, well, of course you can catch the keynotes early in the morning. Uh, I look forward to everybody's super exciting, highly polite comments, because I hear there's a couple people coming to this event, at least a few. Um, I know within the event platform itself, uh, there are sort of chat rooms for each track. Um, I myself will be probably hanging out in some of the diversity and inclusion uh, spaces. Um, you know, honestly, and I, I, this is part of my keynote, you know, one of the great things about Ansible Fest is for me, you know, and I was at the original Ansible Fest that had like, 
20 people in Boston in 2013, and it happened directly across the street from Red Hat Summit, which is why I was able to just ditch my job and, and go across the street to my future job, so to speak. Um, we were, well, I just lost my whole train of thought and ruined everything. Jeez. We got the, you're in the meeting in the chat rooms for the diversity and community piece, um, you know, off platform, is there a Slack? Is there like a site? Um, anything else? Because you know, when the event's over, they're going to come back and consume on demand. But also the community. Yes. Uh, is there discords? I mean, all kinds of stuffs going on, popping up with these virtual also, spaces. One thing I, one thing I should highlight is we do have the uh, Ansible Contributor Summit that goes on the day before uh, Ansible Fest and the day after Ansible Fest. Now, normally uh, this is a pretty intimate event. Um, with the large outreach that we've gotten with uh, this fest, which is much bigger than the original one, uh, much, much, much bigger. Um, we've, and, you know, signing up for the Contributor Summit is part of the registration process for Ansible Fest. So we've actually uh, geared our first day of that event to be towards uh, new or aspiring contributors rather than uh, the traditional format that we've had, which is where we have a lot of engineers and uh, community members sit down physically or in a virtual room and really talk about, you know, all of the things going on under the hood, which is, you know, can be intimidating for new people. Like, yeah. uh, I just wanted to learn about how to contribute, not how to do surgery. Um, so the first day is really geared towards uh, making everything accessible to new people because there turns out there's a lot of new people who are very excited yeah. about Ansible and we want to make sure that we're giving them the content I mean, they need. I mean, cloud architects, so. I mean, SREs are jumping in, Matt, you talked about large scale, you're the chief architect, new blood's coming in. So <laughs> give us an update on your perspective, what people should pay attention to at the event, after the event, communities they could be involved in. And certainly people want to tap into you or an expert and find out what's going on. What's, what's, your, what's your comment? Yeah, you know, we have a whole new session track this year on architects, specifically for SREs and automation architects. We really want to highlight that. Um, we want to give uh, that sort of empowerment to the personas of people who, you know, you're maybe you're not a developer, maybe you're not, you know, operations or 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 a VP of your company. You're you're looking at the architecture of automation, how you can make our automation better for you and your organization. Um, you know, everybody's everybody suffered a lot and struggled with the COVID nineteen. We're no different, right? We want to show how automation can empower you, empower your organization and your company. Um, just like, it, you know, it, we've struggled also. And we're excited about the things that we want to deliver in the next six months to a year. We want you to hear about those. We want you to hear about content and collections. We want you to hear about scalability, execution environments. We're really excited about what we're doing. You know, use the tools that we've provided in the um, Ansible Fest event experience to communicate with us, to talk to us. You can always find us on IRC via email, GitHub. Like we, we want people to continue to engage with us, our community, our open source community to engage with us in the same ways that they have. Uh, and now we just want to share the things that we're working on uh, so that so that we can all collaborate on it and, and automate better. I'm really glad you said that. I mean, again, uh, people are impacted by COVID-19. Uh, I got it sounds like all channels are open. I got to say of all the communities that are um, having to work from home and are impacted by digital uh, developers probably are less impacted. They got more time to game. They don't have to travel. They could hang out. They're used to some of these tools. So I think, I guess, I guess the strategy is turn on all the channels and engage in new ways. And yeah. that seems to be the message, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Robin Bergeron, great to see you again. Matt Jones, great to chat with you. Chief Architect for Ansible Automation Platform. And of course, Robin, Senior Manager for the community team. Thanks so much for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thank you so Good much. To see you. Okay, this is theCUBE's coverage. I'm John Furrier, your host. We're here in the studio in Palo Alto. We're virtual. This is theCUBE virtual with Ansible Fest virtual. We're not face-to-face. -face. Thank you for watching.